we can only accept a third of what we can normally accept. So we, we're having to relearn our business while we were only just getting to know our business as a hospitality venue, as a brew pub, as this kind of new version of a public meeting house that we were creating. So it's got, you know, both so much upside and so many ch challenges that we're working through as a company. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The clarity of what's important and the determination to make the most of it are some of the positives to emerge from the events of the last year. That realization is fueling the appetite of many professionals to get out there and achieve the things they only dreamed about until now. This is creating some incredible opportunities for some and in turn, some amazing offerings for consumers too. Rose Kentish is the owner of Rose Kentish Wines and co-founder of Spark. Rose, how are you going? Very well, thanks, Anthony. Rose, you seem to be doing um, more things than just about anyone in Australia at the moment. You've got a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> yes. Tell, tell us about um, how life is at the moment. Um, Look, I, I had hoped that 2021 was going to bring a certain calmness and clarity after the year that everyone's just had, both for me and, and the world that we're living in. But I seem to be failing at uh, reducing uh, what I'm doing because I just feel passionate on all fronts about all things that I'm involved in. So I'm just um, kind of you know, plugging in the seatbelt and, and getting myself ready for another big year, I think. Well, it's already happening anyway. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about, but you're currently getting through a vintage in McLaren Vale and your first was a couple of decades ago. What, what, what's the vintage looking like at the moment? Uh, look, it's a really lovely vintage. We've got quite moderate weather at the moment, so it's just uh, very, very calm and, and straightforward in terms of often we get quite a lot of heat uh, in March uh, in McLaren Vale and so there's often this kind of real bottleneck or, or jam in terms of getting your fruit um, picked and through the winery but uh, I'm doing a very small vintage this year of red grapes out of McLaren Vale so for me it's it's very accessible very very straightforward and we're just kind of pushing through a couple of small hand picks with the with my team and and I'll be on and out the other side pretty quickly. With uh, the bushfires that we had the previous summer and then the pandemic, what, what sort of impact has that had on, on what you do with the wines and the sort of wines that have, have been created? Yeah, look, for me, it's been uh, quite interesting. I wasn't impacted by the bushfires. I did just buy a farm on Kangaroo Island, which was burnt out before we bought it. So I've got all of that ahead of me in terms of learning to understand and live in an environment or at least be a part of an environment and might not live there, but being, you know, someone that's running a regenerative farm uh, on the island and learning to live with fire. Um, as a winemaker on the mainland, though, um, my focus is wasn't impacted by the fires per se. I did get very involved in assisting people who'd been affected. So we ran a dinner at Spark, which is a company I'm a co-founder of in based in South Australia. And we um, generated uh, quite a lot of funds to support people who'd been burnt by pulling their wines through our venue, doing a big dinner um, and using only wines only from producers that have been deeply affected by the fire. So I tried to get in and help in that way. The pandemic, though, I guess it has affected me as a winemaker. I realised that I was pretty invested and have always been working really closely with chefs around Australia and my wines. I really love the space in which they're on the tables and in, you know, in people's glasses. And I've been working very much in the on-premise space with chefs and sommeliers. And so that just showed me that I was probably more invested in, in that space 
of the restaurants and bars and less in the bottle shop space. So I would, I definitely have my wines in, in some of the independent retailers around Australia, um, but much to a much lesser extent, extent, really just to support what was happening in the restaurants and bars. And so in a way, because of the restaurants, a lot of them closed down or, or had to really adjust what they were doing in 2020, I, my market contracted pretty quickly. Um, however, I'm, I'm a small batch winemaker. I have a really deep, loyal following in that space. So as soon as things have been sort of opening up and, and moving a bit more freely around Australia, um, that certainly has righted itself. And I've been making wine for, as you said, for quite a few years now. So um, I guess I'm, I'm lucky in that I'm, I'm not here for the short term. I'll be making wine when I'm 80 or and beyond, I imagine. So, um, yeah, I, I just really, um, you know, luckily wine's one of those things that does beautifully in the cellar. So um, I'm not worried about things ageing. I'm encouraging that and, and lucky, lucky consumers or customers that get to drink the wine with just a few more months uh, in the bottle than they normally would have or that I haven't run out for the vintage supply. You mentioned that your wine is normally uh, headed towards restaurants and they had it tough for the last year, but you also involved with a venue, a spark at the Whitmore, that would have been heavily impacted. Tell us a bit about that venue and how it started and sort of what the first two years of trade has been like. Sure. <laughs> Look, I used to drive past through the centre of Adelaide as I was looking for a great site for our young team to start brewing beer within the CBD or very close to the, the CBD radius. Um, Spark, we started nearly five years ago. Um, my co-founder, Carrie Allen, and I started it um, as a platform to really lift and amplify female makers in the alcohol space. And um, we, we had been gypsy brewing in other people's breweries and we knew that it was time to, to really get our own maker's space sorted. And we were eyeing off a space nearby uh, in one of the inner suburbs of Adelaide. And I kept driving past this old pub that was closed right in the CBD on one of the squares called Whitmore Square. And I thought, you know, that would be perfect. It's like in the heart of the city. It's for the people. It's it's putting our money where our mouth is in that it's on a, a square that's had, you know, some pretty deep social problems and sparks a social enterprise, a, a full purpose for profit and for purpose enterprise. So I just thought, you know, that would be incredible. And um, so we started a negotiation period with the owners to see if we could lease it. And we thought, you know, a bit of a bit of a fix up paint job and we'll open the doors and we'll be right. Old pub, really, really patchy background history. Um, it used to be a stripper joint. It used to be uh, one of Australia's most successful TABs with 56 phone lines terminating into it. It had pokies in the front room that we were, didn't want to have anything to do with. Um, and, you know, pretty tacky and disgusting place, but this incredibly beautiful old stone building. And um, as soon as we sort of got in there and started to, to – we hadn't opened, but we were starting to design a brew kit that might fit in there because we wanted a space that we could brew, um, even if it was as a microbrewery. And pretty quickly we realised that in order to fit a kit in there that made sense on any commercial level, we'd need to buy the place and knock half of it down and build on. And so we did that. We, we negotiated wow. to buy it and then went, crikey, we better go and find some investors and um, help us buy the real estate because we're in the business of brewing, not, not real estate. And uh, we pulled together an investment group, uh, spent a couple of million dollars on the renovation and won some major national uh, awards for the renovation that we did of building and renovation and found an old pub in the meantime within the pub. So by restoring it and chipping away at some walls, we found external sign writing for the Queen's Arms Hotel, which was a hotel that had been lost in the history of South Australia. And it's one of the first couple of licences that were taken out in South Australia within a couple of years of uh, colonisation back in 1838. So it was pretty cool. Um, 
But, you know, we've been open for two years and half of our life in that building as our venue and our, and our brewing space, uh, we've been in, in COVID. So it's, we had a, a really amazing first year, but still, still uh, doing CapEx works upstairs, opening a rooftop bar, et cetera, literally a couple of months before we were closed down for COVID, or we actually chose to close before uh, the government insisted to, in order for the team to kind of uh, adjust and us to discuss what we could do as a closed venue to still deliver and, and work as a team and do good work, uh, not knowing how long COVID would go for. So pretty crazy, pretty intense <laughs> time. Yeah, yeah. What's it like at the moment? We're still in, in this new normal of COVID. So as a business and as a venue, we're operating at a third of our capacity. So we're still limited by COVID, but it looks normal in terms of everyone's walking around with no masks and, you know, expecting service as normal, but we can only, we can only accept a third of our licence in terms of the number of people that can come into the building. And we're still cleaning based on COVID uh, our own um, COVID requirements and, and regulations that we've put on in place ourselves. So we're still following all of the COVID practices, um, you know, not sharing food. People have to sign in when they come in. We're wiping all the major public services every hour. Like we've still got all of these great practices in place so that people want to come to our venue and feel really safe and really good. But all of that has a cost. We can only accept a third of what we can normally accept. So we, we're having to relearn our business while we were only just getting to know our business as a hospitality venue, as a brew pub, as this kind of new version of a public meeting house that we were creating. The other thing we've, we did is just before COVID, so in November 2019, we bought an old pub in Melbourne. <laughs> And we haven't been able to get there. So the last time we went there was uh, literally sort of February uh, 2020. And um, we've put a, put a deposit down on this old building, did all of the, or nearly all of the development approval work because, yet again, we've bought an old heritage-listed pub that needs major work done to it. And there she sits and we haven't been able to continue. So we've... You know, we're a business that's highly aspirational and deeply hampered uh, at the moment. So it's got, you know, both so much upside and so many ch challenges that we're working through as a company. You mentioned that you like to take on so many things because uh, you get excited by them and there are so many things you would like to achieve. One of them you briefly mentioned was the regenerative farm on Kangaroo Island. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so Sam and I, my husband Sam Harrison, who's a painter by trade and artist, he and I um, have worked together all our lives. We met um, at uni in my early 20s and his mid-20s and we've really uh, done viticulture as our main together work um, and we also set up our own wine bar and restaurant in the ground floor of an old flour mill down at Middleton in South Australia. For about 18 months, we ran that venue together. Um, we only stopped because it was so successful. We were having trouble um, <laughs> running our four very young children in an old flour mill with, with 120 people eating and drinking. So um, we, we decided that in the end, we really loved living there and it was our home because we did consider moving out and making more of that. Uh, but in the end kept saying, but it's our home. So we turned that into just a cellar door for my wines, Rose Kentish Wines, which we opened by appointment. And, um, and really since, since we sold our last vineyard in McLaren Vale, um, I still make wine from other growers' grapes in McLaren Vale, um, but we don't grow and haven't grown our own grapes since 2016. He and I have been looking for a, a, horticultural project or a horticultural farm space land in which we can contribute as kind of a legacy piece and we had been discussing if that was going to be another vineyard or more into um, the roots of farming which are more back to my childhood roots I grew up on on land um, with stock and and vegetable growing and all sorts of stuff down in the southeast of South Australia 
and Sam, my husband, grew up on the vineyard, um, which we subsequently bought um, back in the um, mid-90s. Um, so we, we thought there's a project for us together again um, on, on farming land and we wanted to do it with, we're both deeply interested in regenerative practices. We'd, we'd, practi- we'd use very similar practices around organics and biodynamics on, our, on the vineyards, but we weren't, we weren't registered. We just were following, learning and developing our understanding as we've been going along. Um, but regeneration as a concept really appeals to us to really work on the health of the soil and therefore the animals and anything you, you choose to grow there will benefit. Um, and so we had been actually looking in Tassie and again, because I was thinking about great growing uh, and a natural space for me to look outside of the mainland if we were going to look to a place that also felt a bit like a place to retreat to or get away to on some level. And then <clears throat> through COVID, we kind of looked to our own island on our, in our own state of Kangaroo Island and thought, hang on a second, we've got a, a, an island right close by, much easier for us to get to. And that's something that I guess the lack of being able to travel in COVID really showed us. And we, we just happened to be talking to various farmers on the island and and one of them said actually I might be interested in selling a 300 acre block of land on the cliff tops looking north very remote on the very west of the island come and have a look see what you think and so we went and we walked around we, we took our four teenage and young adult children with us and walked around and it, there was something that resonated with us on that parcel of land it had been fully burnt and um, refenced most of it, refenced, and um, but there was something about it that that spoke to us, and we all said we can we can create something here. There there was no um, building structures or anything on there, um, so we thought there's both a piece here in terms of building and building something off the grid that is fully about sustainability and regeneration that we can do. So Sam and I've built and renovated and built things through our lives so we've got a real love for that and we've got a a building project at the moment in our garden at the back of the mill which we nearly finished so when we finish that we'll be ready um, and we're just starting in the very early stages of understanding what the building might need to be what technology it might house in order to sit lightly on the earth and actually function itself without any need for um, grid power or town water or any of those things and to be really resilient against fire. So that's a project for us. <laughs> so at the moment there's just 130 sheep on there that occasionally run loose and we have to go over the island and find them on other people's farms <laughs> and, and, and walk them home again. Um, and we get to go there and as soon as we go across the water there's this real sense of getting away, but also for us to get to come together and do it, do that project together is a really beautiful thing. You just briefly mentioned another project that's about to come to fruition, which is a retreat uh, just behind the old flour mill. Um, t- tell us a little bit about that and how that came about. Yeah, look, really interesting. Um, this has been a f- four year building project for Sam and I. And which means he hasn't picked up a paintbrush, an artist's paintbrush for a little while. Um, but we were, we had a, an L shape of buildings in the garden. We've got two acres of garden behind this old flour mill in Middleton, which we've been told, I've never got this validated, but we've been told that the mill that we live in is our family home is the biggest freestanding mill in the southern hemisphere remaining and apparently there are there were about 15 stone mills all along the south coast um, of South Australia and a long time ago you know um, 1850s um, farmers well used to from their barley and wheat crops be able to load onto river boats um, their harvest uh, and it would be then boated down to the mouth of the Murray, loaded onto the first narrow gauge railway 
and then brought up to our mill and ground and probably other mills along the coastline, um, ground into flour and then loaded out of Port Elliot and Victor Harbour. This is before Port Adelaide was, a, was an international port. And that was very successful for about uh, 80, 70 to 90 years, somewhere in there. And But they had a lot of shipwrecks. <laughs> uh, the the harbours were too shallow and it was really causing them a lot of problems. So they uh, moved all of the international port activity up to Port Adelaide. And so that really made the mill in that location quite defunct. And it then had this really interesting history over time where it became a stock and feed place and, um, you know, had dirt floors and there was a stable, an L-shaped building of a stable, an old fernery and a barn. Um, and these date back to 1850 and they were withering away. The, the brickwork was withering away and we, feel, we felt and we still feel that we have, we're custodians and that we've got a responsibility to to keep these buildings intact. And so we started a project of really putting proper roof structure on them to, and restoring the walls and then decided that there was probably a way to do this because, you know, obviously to do any more than that is quite expensive and, and extensive. And so we kind of walked through these spaces and thought, you know, if we put a pool in here in the centre of the L shape, um, and turned these buildings into four king-size bedrooms with their own bathrooms. And we have a structure, an area which is a central living, cooking, enjoyment space. And people could come in a really private location and just be. And they can write and they can read and they can sleep. Or they could use it as a base to then really connect in with producers chefs, um, you know, physical experiences such as, you know, there's some incredible walks, kayaking, all sorts of things to do on the Flurio. So we could offer a space which would then use those buildings and make sense of the money that we needed to spend there to do the work. And in a very private, almost reclusive way for people to come and, and be in a private garden but at their own ability to come and go and so we've been restoring Sam's using his artisanal ability and he's got you know as we've been farmers and you know the fact that you need to create and build a lot of the things that you need to fix things and do things on on farms he and also we've uh, renovated a couple of houses in Adelaide over the years he's done an extraordinary job so far we're nearly done in bringing these old buildings not only back to life but essentially creating almost like a, a micro hotel or a um, it's really hard to define there I, there's nothing really like it that I can see because it's not I, I can say more what it's not than what it is but if you can imagine that that you know you've got these very luxurious um, spaces that where everything in them has been made in a really refined way. And where we haven't made them, we've engaged, say, um, some of the glass blowers at the jam factory in Adelaide to blow the glass lights, or um, the one of the furniture makers is, is hand making these incredible mirrors um, for us. And there'll be artwork and, and um, extraordinary linen and beds so that you just have the best sleeps. Um, you know, it's really about creating a sanctuary for people to just come and relax and it's got a 15 by 5 metre pool that you can relax in and a spa and just the ability to just be in this incredible old established garden that's right in the heart of the village. And we've called it uh, Pargo and Pargo is Latin for village and we wanted to acknowledge that we're in a village so we've got the the busyness of that you can walk down the street and get a, a coffee or some lunch or whatever you feel like but you're also it took, you're also in a space that took a village to build and that's right from the beginning of when it was built through to now all of the artisans working on creating these spaces um so we're nearly there we're nearly there i'm working on the uh, a book that people can come and 
and flip through. A book might not be the right word, maybe a compendium that's going to be in the rooms that really takes people on a journey and tells them about some of the artisans and chefs and producers and elder Indigenous elders and various people that they can connect with and enjoy and experience something of the region with without being a particularly touristy thing. So really connecting in with makers and getting under the skin of the region in a way that locals can show you rather than just being a tourist experience. Give us a sense of what life is like on on the property. I understand you have an orchard there and uh, you spent some time in it yesterday. What 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 is life like there? Um, we've got a productive garden that we tend. I use the word we very loosely because it's <laughs> my husband that tends it and I'm, I'm, um, I'm still uh, based most of the time in Adelaide. Um, our youngest is just in year 12 this year. So when he's done, I'll, I'll be moving back uh, down there. But um, I do spend a lot of time in the garden on the weekends. We've got an old orchard that was planted, well, old. It's about 20 years old, so it's probably just about to hit its hit a really nice stage of, of productivity and maturity. But we've also got, um, I've used from um, making years and years of doing traditional method uh, riddling of, of um, sparkling shiraz. I've got old wooden crates, which um, instead of just breaking them down and, and um, or passing them on, we've actually kept and used, filled them with beautiful soil that we've built up over time. And we fill those with all sorts of seeds and seedlings and run a pretty productive garden. So we pretty much eat out of the garden and give a lot of our produce to friends. We've got chooks and um, so we, other than probably protein and dairy, we're pretty self-sufficient between the fruit and veg um, that we grow. And that's, that's, you know, an extraordinary thing to do in terms of just is so beautiful. The difference in the produce is from what you can get in a supermarket is obviously a no-brainer but we also love that bartering and exchange process so we do a lot of that with wine and and veggies to swap with you know fantastic local coffee roasters for beans and all of that sort of thing and I love that that part that food and wine and brews and gin and things that I make all, all allow you to be able to share and exchange with the things that you do well for the things that other people do well so that your life is richer um, because you get to enjoy things that are, are made in and around you or grown in and around you and, and you get to share that, which is really something that feeds me as a maker, I think. So, yes, yesterday I spent a good chunk of the day picking quinces and... Um, I've cooked them all down and the intention is to use some obviously to eat and make cakes with and things like that. But the, the majority of them um, I'm actually going to distill. And um, for Spark, we started uh, distilling a couple of years ago but in a, in a very focused way in 2020 and into 21. Um, so I'm going to make a quince gin for Spark. Mm, so a lot of fun. And a lot of ideas and smells and things that give me ideas by just spending time in the garden and in the orchard, I start to think of all the things that I could be making and sharing with others. Where did it all start for you? Where did that interest in food and and wine and the connection to the land begin? Yeah, it's a good question. I grew up about a mile down the road from my grandparents. So I was, I'm the youngest of four children raised on a farm down the road. And my dad was the eldest of six children. And his dad passed away when he was quite young. And so he sort of immediately became the the oldest child in terms of pulling everyone along on the farming journey with, with him as a young dad himself. And we used to be given a lot of responsibility in terms of um, going down to my grandmother's really established garden and, and learning from her how to pick the asparagus correctly from the asparagus bed to leave asparagus for next year but also get the beauty of this year in the harvest. Or I used to have a little 
on the 70 and my job was to to ride around to the the dairy which was about two kilometers from our our front gate and um pick up a bucket of milk clip the lid on put it between you know on the seat between my legs and hold on and ride <laughs> one hand at home with a bucket of milk which i then had to skim off the cream make the butter you know churn the butter from that um and work with my my mum was well my mum my mum was amazing in that she really took the job of parenting and running a home seriously as a career so she loved everything about being a mum and uh raising the four of us and giving teaching us the the natural harmony of how you produce from your garden and how you connect with other producers around you in order to do that. So, and then we also had a lot of international exchange students that would come every year from all around the globe and then bring their food influence into our homes. So, you know, one year there was about 30 big rounds about the size of a pizza each of speculas that my mum had made with the Dutch exchange student and, you know, Japanese, we learned to make sushi and, you know, this is in the... 70s when that wasn't kind of done and so there was a big food influence from my parents in their desire to entertain throw the doors open we were the place where people just came and big parties happened and it was just never a problem you just made made all of that work and everything was kind of done from scratch so I've never really been afraid of that and in fact I've quite loved it and thought it quite normal to make things and make them from scratch and enjoy that process of then sharing that. And um, I know in my 20s, I'd done a degree not in winemaking, in something different, but I found myself taking a lot of wine electives around wine marketing, wine tasting, you know, just basic wine education learning and sort of history about winemaking, all sorts of stuff. And I didn't really think about it. I thought about it more as just this fascination with producing and making. And it was actually my husband that woke me up in actually in the middle of the night um, when I was 25 and we had one little little toddler. And we just sold our house in Adelaide, done a bit of a trip um, into Europe and just kind of, you know, enjoying a lot about food and wine and all those good things came home and was we were both ready for the next thing which I thought was just about getting back into doing some strategic marketing work which is what I'd studied done my first degree in and he was a painter and artist and he said you know my parents vineyard is on the market and I reckon that would really help in grounding me and balancing my painting, which is very kind of esoteric and in my head with something more earthy and connected and productive. And that's how I think I can contribute to this family unit. And we could have more children there and raise them on the land. And you've always loved wine and you've always talked about making, you could, you have this um, potential ability to be a winemaker. I was just like, what are you talking about? You know, I don't know where you get this from. And then it just, the idea wouldn't leave me. And I just started to just build on and develop this fascination with the fact that I could be a maker. I already was a maker of sorts, but more in baking and playing around with perfume or, you know, oil-based perfumes and, you know, all sorts of stuff that I would always do. And I'd studied sinotropathy and, you know, I was just interested in tinctures and all these kind of things. But I couldn't let the idea go. And he'd grown up on this vineyard. His parents had it on the market. It was a really renowned vineyard for quality. Um, it was a contributor to, so an icon vineyard that was known as, which meant it contributed uh, regularly to, to Penfolds or was contracted to Penfolds. So it was a regular contributor to Grange and some of their top, top um, brands. Um, and I thought, God, how am I going to do this? I'm working with such ex potentially expensive fruit in that we would hold back what we needed and sell the rest on. And I don't know what I'm doing. And so he and I sat down. He said, well, he didn't really know what he was doing either as a grower. So how are we going to do this? He'd grown up there, but that's very different and knowing how to achieve extraordinary excellence every year. Um, 
And so we both engaged people who were leaders in their field, so a viticulturalist that he knew about and, and really admired and trusted that could take him on a journey of learning. And I did the same with a technical winemaker that could take me on that learning of the sciences um, that I needed in order to make sense of what I could taste. And I'd never really questioned what I could taste. I just needed to learn the science. And so we both went on this journey and for four years, I think it was, so from 97 to 2001, I gave away the wines I made each vintage, so my barbecue wines, and um, really learning. And we sold, um, you know, pretty much all the fruit on except for what I held back to learn really the science of what I was trying to achieve flavour-wise. And the first wine I made off that, that vineyard was was a wine that in Latin what meant fruit of the earth or fruit of frugal earth. And I was really trying to capture in the bottle what I was tasting at full ripeness in that vineyard in vintage and what I could smell and what was coming coming off that land. So for me, the challenge, those connections were already happening in my olfactory system. I just needed to learn how to create them. And so we started this process and then in 2001, I, I um, released my first Shiraz and then um, over the course of, of years, I started to win some national awards and international awards and thought, oh, I might be able to do this. I might be okay at this. And, um, and really in starting Spark in 2016 as a for-purpose company, I'd already started giving money from a range of more, more daily drinking, uh, affordable wines, to companies, um, to charities essentially around Australia. And I was looking at trying to connect my making with purpose. So it was felt great to be an, a winemaker that was becoming known for quality and ability and those kind of things, but I needed to contribute forward. I needed to do more and directly connect that to my work. So I was starting to give money away to charities but it was really interesting that because I was an alcohol producer they didn't want to acknowledge any kind of partnership so it was fine for me to just give money like everyone else just in the front end of the website but there was no ability to form any kind of partnership that was more deep and meaningful and and that I could actually let other people know that I was giving this money away and doing something that you know I was intending to build on as a maker that contributed to charities in that space. So I thought that's really interesting. So it was a combination of that and meeting and working and starting a business with Carrie Allen called Spark, where we thought, you know, isn't it interesting that an alcohol company can't contribute money and be be associated with charities, but companies that, you know, make products that are full of sugar that can, you know, cause chronic disease in things like diabetes or whatever, it's fine to be acknowledged and connected to charities. So we just thought there's so much social change and social learning that needs to happen. Let's let's create a, an, an alcohol company or a beverage company for good and for good, you know, for the purpose of changing the industry for good and making beverages that are all natural, delicious, mid-strength by category and doing good work, like contributing forward, not out of profit, but directly out of what we're making. And we'll just work like crazy to to try and get the company to a point of making profit rather than trading or greenwashing or social washing off the fact that we're contributing. But it would take years to actually make a profit to then be able to start contributing. So a company that's been very much founded from deep values and then growing from that point. Rose, you have so much on, I can't even keep up. I'm not sure how you handle it. But what are you most looking forward to after the year that we've had? Um, I think I'm looking forward to giving my team a chance to do what they do best in, in an environment that is more deeply corrected. So... What I mean by that is if I go back to looking at what's happening 
in terms of this new COVID normal space for, for my Spark team, for example, we're operating and trying to appear like the world is normal and operate normally, but the team is challenged by the fact that we are not in a normal scenario. But no one wants to know that or remember that or be reminded by that. And so you're, you're in an environment where you're trying to be hospitable and welcome people whilst also juggle all of this new information and new way of doing things in order to keep everyone safe. And I'm really looking forward to my team being able to do this with less effort and more joy because it is somehow easier for them to do it. I think that would give me a huge amount of joy. I'm looking forward in the other aspects of my life to, to the farm and to Pargo, the luxury retreat, to my children. I'm looking for for more contact, more time, more, more, I guess, not connections. I'm actually really connected with my children and I feel very lucky, but I, I feel like there needs to be more time around the doing of things, which doesn't sound surprising given that I've got a lot on, but, but to be a maker, you need to be able to hold something and look at it from every angle and smell it and taste it and remake it a number of times and critique it. And and I made a number of things. I actually launched a spirit range for Spark last year based on distilling brews that were ageing because of COVID and, and that a lot of restaurants and, and bars are closed down that would normally have been pulling through Spark stock. And so it was just an incredibly difficult environment in which to make and to have that beautiful opportunity to be deeply creative that helps build, you know, the nuance and sophistication that I look for in the things that I make. And I'm looking forward this year to hopefully have a bit more space, buffer time around the, the really exciting work that I've got ahead of me in the space of making as a maker um, both with my winemaking and also um, for Spark across brews and distilling that, that really deeply excite me and I'm just really looking forward to that sense of moving out of just knee-jerk responses to, a, to an environment and back into a better space that is, has, has a film or a space around it in order to protect you long enough to build something that you're deeply proud of. Well, Rose, your energy is inspiring and um, we're very honoured that you had a little bit of spare time to talk to us today to share just a bit about what you're doing. Uh, really look forward to seeing what you do uh, over the next year and especially with the project in Melbourne when you uh, get your hands on the building. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> we've, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today. Please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. I will do. Thanks, Anthony, for having me. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>